Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Peter Mann. Peter Mann is the CEO and founder of Virginia-based ORNC, a leading air purification company known for its efficient, intuitive, and reliable products. He is also the chair of the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers Air Cleaner Council. In 2021, RNC merged with Avimor Technologies and is now a motor technology company with a clean energy mission and a new manufacturing facility in Radford, Virginia that makes products in the USA. Previously, Peter was the founder and CEO of the Austin, Texas-based Allen Corp., an air purification company he built and successfully exited. He went to college on a Navy ROTC scholarship and then served four years, including a tour in the Red Sea during the first Gulf War as a communications officer and then gunnery officer on the USS McCandless. Peter is late diagnosed autistic and now advocates for autism awareness in the workplace. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Excited to be here. All right. Well, let's, let's dive right in. Um, what to your mind, is innovation. I guess for me, innovation is really just finding a new or better way to do something. And that could be a process, could be a product. I think for us in our business, that's really where it shows up mostly is just looking at a particular process or a product that we're developing. And, you know, how do we make it better? Because we live in such a competitive global world and innovation is really a key differentiator in being successful. It really is. It really is. And I love the simplicity and elegance of your definition, because that is really what it boils down to. New doesn't always mean better. Sometimes new is just new. It's just different. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> new and better is an important distinction. I think sometimes people get uh, a bit enamored with new for newness sake and don't always stop mm -hmm. to think about, is this better? Yeah, I agree. I think it's part of having a more of a continuous improvement mindset. Mm. For me, it's like, you know, if you're developing a website, it's like it's never finished. It could always get better. Mm -hmm. Right. And not to be a perfectionist, but I think it's also being humble enough to not being so married to this is the ultimate. Right. You can always find something better or somebody may bring a different perspective that you'd never thought of. And so I think that's part of what makes business fun at least for me, maybe I'm not normal, but finding new and better ways to do things, it's kind of part of just natural evolution or progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's another element of it is the sort of timelessness of innovation. You know, the word has some age to it, I'm sure. But I think it's a human trait, you know, more than anything else that we've been innovating longer than we've had the label or title of innovation. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think if you look at even just a lot of products, it's just incremental improvements uh -huh. over what existed before. It's like AI is the big thing right now. If you went back 30 years ago, that wouldn't you like that, that concept? <laughs> it's like wouldn't even have been in the realm of possibilities, but it's just been incremental improvements to get to where we are today. Mm, that's an interesting point. Yeah, as we talk now, I think what we're on GPT-4 <laughs> <laughs> and it's all anyone can talk about is all the different capabilities and possibilities around AI, written word, visual, music, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. And it feels like, feels like it kind of came out of nowhere. But to your point, this is something that has been building over time. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think how you use it is going to evolve as well. Hmm. I was reading on LinkedIn, someone shared some posts about how to use the open AI or chat GPT. And it's like, gosh, I've been using it wrong. <laughs> I've been using it like a Google search engine, like answer this question. Mm. And he's like, no, you have to frame this scenario. And like, if you have like a brainstorming session with a team, explain like what the situation is, and then list five bullet points for the best blah, blah, blah. Right. It's like a conversation. Right. It's pretty powerful what it comes back with if you feed it like what it's looking for. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. And your comment about how to talk to it is I'm yeah. kind of chuckling to myself because I treated it the same way. You know, it's almost like Google <laughs> on steroids, but it's not that. 
they called it chat GPT. And you would think it would help you kind of get in the mindset of, no, talk to this thing, like, yeah, have a conversation, but it doesn't feel natural to start there. Right. You could do things like if Steve Jobs were to make product X, how would he market that product? What features would he put into the product? And it's just really fascinating what it comes up with. It's like, wow. Right, right. It's <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. It's terrifying. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a lot of things. <laughs> exactly. It's the unknown. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's such a clear example of innovation in our current world. Absolutely. I can imagine points in history where other things created this level of fear, confusion, excitement. Mm hmm I can imagine those sorts of turning points in the evolution of human achievement. Yeah. I mean, I remember back in the early days of e-commerce, it's like when websites were new, people are like, I'm not putting my credit card out there. Right. It was just this fear. It's like, I'm going to call in and talk to a person mm -hmm. thinking that you're reading your card over the phone and someone's typing it in is going to be more secure than <laughs> <laughs> putting it into the website. But that was the mindset 25 years ago. Yeah. It really was. And I think <laughs> I think it's a it's easy to forget the other times we were this scared of a technological advance. Yeah. And I think that's the hallmark of innovation, disruptive innovation. People like to call this this kind of a step change. I really think it's something to be celebrated as a human achievement. Yeah, it's fascinating mm -hmm. just to see like how far we've come in such a short period of time. I mean, even for entrepreneurs, like before the internet. I mean, you pretty much had to work for a company, mm. right? You, there, was, there wasn't podcasting, there wasn't e-commerce sites or right. the whole Silicon Valley. It was just big mainframe computer type companies. My dad's generation, he worked for GE and that's like, you, you work for them for life. Right. Until they realize they want to like downsize and then yeah, exactly. <laughs> pull the rug out for when you had Exactly. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was the way, you know, even when I started in my career. The folks that were there, the people that were mentoring you, the folks that had been there 20, 30 years when I started, they were of that same mindset. You know, you yeah. got a job at Procter & Gamble. You work there until you retire. Until you retired. Yeah, that was it. And you got a pension yeah. and everything was great. Right, right. Exactly. And <laughs> until so, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, until it wasn't. Exactly. And so I think you're right. The Internet did sort of democratize a lot of things, you know, it made it easier to apply for jobs. It made it easier to explore what other jobs were available. It made it easier mm -hmm. for companies to communicate with employees of other companies. Right. So yeah, that's a great point. It, it really did change a lot about how we work, but also how we find work. Entrepreneurship is infinitely easier today, even down to things like LegalZoom, where you can mm -hmm. quickly and easily create entities so many of the barriers are down. And your example also made me think about professional services. I worked at McKinsey for a few years. And if you think about creating a management consulting firm 20 years ago, like <laughs> how would you go about doing that? How would you generate great thought leadership? How would you establish a reputation? How would you do all those things? Mm -hmm. So I think it really, it really is changing not just products and product-based companies, but also it has that opportunity to bring more people and more experts into the professional services world as entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think if you're younger and you grew up with a lot of technology, you may not have the perspective. Mm -hmm. It may not feel like it. I mean, and it's not easy, but it is a world of difference. And I think if you're a bit older, you, you have a different appreciation and perspective on it. That's a great point. It makes me feel good about being older. <laughs> too. I'm older too. <laughs> uh, so, so you talked about, you know, thinking how you think about innovation with your products and services. Tell me more about that. You know, your definition about around a new and better way. Are there specific examples in your mind of the opportunities you seized within your organization to, to innovate? Yeah. So we make right now purifiers, but I would say we're an electric motor technology company. We merged with a motor company a couple of years ago, and that's kind of how we ended up in Southwest Virginia near Virginia Tech. Oh, right. And there's a few electric motor companies. So it's just like a hub. Mm. There's a ton of engineering talent here, but most of the companies make government products. And so they don't promote themselves <laughs> kind of under the radar. Right. 
but we're doing consumer products. And so we're getting as much attention as we can. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're in the process of reshoring our manufacturing back to Virginia based on our electric motor technology. And it's through innovation that's allowing us to do it. If you look at the research reports, I know Reuters and Consumer Reports have surveyed consumers and American customers prefer American products, but very few want any kind of a premium, (laughs) which is why I like the jobs went overseas to begin with. Right. I grew up in Syracuse and it was a pretty large manufacturing Mm -hmm. area. And I kind of watched those jobs go away in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And we kind of figured out how to bring it back is pretty exciting for me. And it's really through taking out cost and the cost difference between here and China is really just labor. Right. And so for us, the innovation is how do you design the product to take steps out of the process? It's really it's just that simple. Right. The concept is simple, but it's really difficult to do. It's taken us two or three years of trial and error <laughs> to get to where we are. But I'm really excited about kind of where we're going to have a product that's actually better and lower cost than the imports for a high tech type product. It's not really been me. Our engineering team is the, <laughs> the ones that have, that have done yeah. all the work. But yeah, it's really exciting, I think. Yeah. It's all innovation and it's like you're never finished, right? There's always ways to make a process better or take a 30 second process and make it 28 seconds. Right, right, <laughs> right. I'd love that example. Because I don't think people often associate innovation with things like reshoring. Mm -hmm. It looks on paper like a decision. Yeah. But you just broke down. Yes, it's a decision. It's a focus area. It's a priority. It's a strategic approach. But it's enabled by innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And cost and price are super critical. The air purifier space, it's been pretty interesting. It, It wasn't that competitive a market before COVID. And then... Right. Everybody wanted to be in the market when <laughs> COVID hit. And now that we're on the other side of it, the market's back to really about the size it was pre-COVID. Mm. But yet we have all these competitors that didn't exist before. Oh, right. So it is oversaturated. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about where we're positioned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. But it's almost like, you know, if you see Peloton where they kind of shot up, Right. Like they're in extreme case. And then it's like, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Coming down the other side is not pretty. No, no. Our category is not that dramatic, but it is like everybody and their brother was getting into this market. And what's interesting is the Chinese factories will go out and develop products, come up with a catalog, and they'll shop it around for anybody that wants to buy it. And then during COVID, people were like, yeah, I'll buy that, that, and that. Right. And they're already tooled up. They're already ready to go into manufacturing. Mm, mm -hmm. And it's really easy to get into the space. The problem is there's no real differentiation. Right, right. To what they're offering, it's just a product. Right. And the people buying it in our case is really interesting is that I don't think they really understand the market. It was just an opportunity that presented itself. It's like, you haven't been doing this and understand it. And you're just buying off of a catalog. Right. <laughs> right. Because to develop a product during COVID and design it, and de- like you just not enough time. Like, you have to go and just, just source it. I see. So you're just buying something white label, slapping your name on the front. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And putting it up on Amazon. Correct. You get an Amazon account and putting it up on, on Amazon. That's a lot of what happened. Because that's the only way you could respond quickly uh, during COVID with supply chain issues and, and whatnot. Right. It's like. Right. Interesting. So do you anticipate any opportunities as a result of the way things are coming back and the way you all are uniquely positioned? Yeah. yeah we're fine if the market contracts because we're just going to take market share. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident because I, I, I know our costs and I have a sense for everyone else's costs and I know our performance. and. We just have a better story, right. I think, right. you know, with sustainability, reshoring, American values, environmental practices, <laughs> you kind of name it. Yeah. It's, These are things you normally have to pay a premium for. Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying through innovation, 
we figured out how to do it at lower cost. Yeah, through innovation. Yeah. That's incredible. And we've got some really good endorsements is also a big part. Although I wouldn't call these endorsements. It's just like more like case studies where mm. PBS had a documentary on Dr. Fauci that came out a week or so ago. And there he is giving a press conference or a TV interview. And then our air purifier is right there. <laughs> so it's like, okay, so yeah. if, if it's good enough for him, right. maybe. <laughs> that's, that's your whole advertising campaign, right? Yeah. Here. Just a, it's like a screen well, grab. Me. Yeah. Yeah. You either love him or hate him. Right. But I think people that buy air purifiers, people that hate him probably aren't caring about the air quality. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> and, and I think whether you agree with him or disagree with him, you have to assume that he has his pick of air purifiers to use. Yeah. NIH. Yeah. yeah they don't just buy anything. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. That is huge. I'd love your definition of innovation. What isn't innovation? Yeah, I think I go back to the Chinese manufacturers. They take pride in copying. Mm -hmm. And innovation, in my mind, is not copying. You're not really making anything new or better. You're just replicating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's culturally very different, but they take so much pride in being able to copy something. And it's funny because I have some colleagues at some other electric motor companies and they laugh because sometimes they've made mistakes in their motors and they copy the mistakes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, People here don't have the mindset of copying being a virtue, but over there, right. it's like, hey, I didn't have to put all that time into development. I'm just going to copy it. Mm. But I don't really think you're advancing anything, you know, if you're, if you're copying someone. Right, right, right. It's not new or better if you're copying. No. Right? It's, <laughs> so it, yeah, it's the same. It's, and it, it's the yeah. same, even the mistakes. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's hilarious. Got, even copy the mistakes. That's great. So I wonder about this aspect of copying things or replicating things and things like that. As you look at, say, at the peak in 2020, the peak of the pandemic, if I'm a leader or if I'm looking for something profitable, maybe I'm looking at masks, I'm looking at air filters, I'm looking at gloves, I'm looking at other things. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that these sort of white label options from China would look attractive from a cost timing standpoint, all those things. And if I make air filters for air conditioners at home, and I can now just add HEPA filters to my lineup, if I'm the head of marketing, I'm going to present this as a great innovation. Mm. Oh, we're expanding our product portfolio. We're moving into a new demographic. We're doing all these things. Look at this innovative thing I've done as, as a marketer or as a salesperson. And I wonder about the role of technology in the definition of innovation. Have you thought much about that? Because mm -hmm. the copying piece, I think, is I'm an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer. So that is near and dear to my heart. That is not innovative. But <laughs> can you use something that has been copied to an innovative end? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're expanding your product line, it's a bit of a stretch, I think. For innovation in itself, if you're just looking at the product or you're looking at what process they're going through. Right. I think about things from a customer perspective. And for the customer, it's really nothing new. It's just more of the same. Whereas somebody like James Dyson that found a way to make a bagless vacuum cleaner when previously they were all bags. And it's like, that's a complete innovation. Yeah. Yeah. These guys aren't really putting in the time and effort to innovate. They're just going out just like, boom. I see. We're in the market for this. And it's, you know, you have a bunch of Me Too products when you do that. Yeah. And also from a marketing standpoint, I don't think you really know what you're selling. Right. Right. Exactly. It feels like what can happen is people kind of get locked into an inside out definition of innovation. Mm. We've never done this before. So it's innovative. Yeah. But I love the customer lens that you bring to it, which makes it more universal and more sort of human. Yeah. I can't narrow the term innovation down enough so that I can just kind of slap it on anything. You have to do something different, solve a different problem for the customer. Right. And ideally, if you're a marketing person, you have a unique selling proposition. And what is it if you're selling yeah. something you bought off the shelf? Exactly. Like, exactly. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great point of view. Are you just leveraging your brand name? Mm -hmm. And the brand has a lot of value. So just putting this name on it 
instills trust in people. I think that's the logic that goes into it. Right, right. Or they have a distribution channel built out, and this is just one more thing to run through the machine. Right, exactly. I'm hearing a lot of altruistic elements in kind of how you go about your business, and I'm also hearing a lot of timelessness about how you think about things. And if you run that sort of marketing-focused lens around innovation through that filter, no pun intended, (laughs) it it doesn't survive. Yeah. 300 years ago, before branding was a thing, putting your brand name on something literally would not have been innovation because it would not have existed. But 300 years ago, finding a better way to remove particles from air would have been innovation. Right. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a fascinating conversation. I don't want to let you go without asking you if you have any advice that you'd share with innovators out there. Yeah, I think a lot of it's a mindset. I think being open to new ideas, not being married to this is the way we've always done things, Uh kind of allows you to be open to innovation. I think diversity, I think having diverse inputs, it's not the most senior person's opinion that should carry the day. Right. Steve Jobs always said, the best idea should win. It doesn't matter who they come from, right? Mm. If you have an innovative culture or innovative mindset, it really doesn't matter who comes up with the ideas. You just value the idea on the idea. Mm. And it's just such a competitive marketplace. Why would you not do that? You have to be a little bit humble. It may be the idea that you had isn't the best idea. And you have to be able to be okay with that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. And it's funny to think about it, but the way you laid it out, diversity almost feels like a natural byproduct of a pure pursuit of innovation. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's like, you don't know what you don't know, right? And if you have a culture or you have a group of people, it's like, let's just hire more people like us. It's like, you're never going <laughs> to... You're going to be limited in the ideas, and ultimately it's the ideas that drive organizations. Right, right, right. That sparked a thought around, you talked about being based near Virginia Tech and a lot of engineers being involved in your process. Have you seen innovative ideas come from places outside of engineering function or the engineering department or like the traditional engineers? I mean, we have a lot of engineers here, mm-hmm. so that's a lot, yeah, 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 yeah. a lot of what we have. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're trying some different things, I guess, on our marketing team mm-hmm. in terms of video. We haven't really done this yet, but once we start manufacturing in the next couple months, we're going to be really transparent about like how we do things Oh, wow! and putting a face behind the name yeah. because our competitors are all made, not all, but 95% made in China mm-hmm. and they're not going to show a Chinese factory or if they do, it's not going to, it's not going to have the same <laughs> impact. They don't, yeah. they don't want to show that. Right, right. Right. Whereas we can show our folks here taking it from raw materials to a finished good to shipping it from our facility mm-hmm. to the end user. And you can't do that in China. Yeah. That's innovation in that context. Yeah. And it's enabled by the technological innovation. Correct. Yeah. And the sort of financial innovation around it. Yeah. And I think being just transparent and pulling the curtain back and like, this is how we do it. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that. Peter Mann, thank you so much for your time. Innovation is finding a new and better way to do things. It's a great definition. And thanks for sharing your insights and your experience. And thank you for the work you're doing and the way you're going about it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. I really enjoyed this. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.